I'm having a little bit of a hooded cardigan moment today because we are finally jumping into Throne of Glass. <laughs> it's Sarah welcome back to another video here on my channel I hope you guys are doing well happy Wednesday surprise we've got a Wednesday video this week so today's plan is to finally start the throne of glass recapping videos I am stoked I hope you guys are as well I love these books this is definitely my favorite SJM series by far my favorite SJM man of all time is from this series and I will not be telling you who he is if you're already a viewer and you've watched me talk about my other fantasy shows give me your best guess who do you think my favorite character is <laughs> if you're new to this channel and this is how you're finding me hello welcome in my name is Sarah I talk about fantasy content over here whether that's books movies TV shows I'm recapping the plots in the style of Mike's Mike and Carrie can read speaking of Carrie if you're like me prepping yourself for the next Crescent City book that's coming out because even though I don't like the series I will be reading it. I have to know what happens. She has got videos recapping the entirety of Akatar and Crescent City, but she said she wasn't gonna do Throne of Glass. So that's why I'm here so that we have both. But check her videos out if you're doing like a reread of everything because it's pretty heavily implied that somehow all three of the series are gonna be tied together in the next Crescent City, or at least we're leading to that. So we're all kind of rushing to reread and understand everything before we dive into CC3. So it's just, it's really funny to me that I love this series as much as I do because I started with Akatar, as many of us do, and then I read Crescent City. I don't like Crescent City, okay? I, I'm not a fan. But freaking Throne of Glass, I, I uh, buddy read it with a friend of mine and it was so much fun. We had the time of our lives just like live tweeting each other as we were reading. It's it's so good, okay? So if you're if you're an SJM hater and you're here for whatever reason, just be nice in the comments, okay? I don't make fun of what you guys like to read. Don't pick on us because we like this kind of stuff. It's good tropey fantasy. Sometimes that's all you want, okay? We don't have to pretend it's more than it is, but this series in particular is pretty damn good. <laughs> Today we're going to be talking about Assassin's Blade, which is the book that I read first in the series. There are two different ways that you can kind of read them. It's an eight book series and this is how I did it. So that's how these videos are going to come out. So we're starting with Assassin's Blade today. This series is very much young adult as far as the romance subplots go. So it's a lot of fade to black. If you've read Akatar or Crescent City, you're probably like, I thought she didn't write that way. She did for this one because this is her first series. So this one, like I said, is young adult, but I think it has some of the best romance she's ever written. So take from that what you will. <laughs> so just a little bit of backstory on the book itself. Assassin's Blade is five prequel novellas that centers on our main girl, Selena, and characters from her past that may or may not show up as the books go on. This book is probably my least favorite out of all of them just because of its format. You know, as I said, it's just a couple short novellas. Um, it's still good. It's full of like little details and fun little things that when they come back later on, you're like, oh my God, I remember that, like no way. And the way that everything sort of ties together is really cool, but there is a little bit of an argument to be made that like she had to make this because characters show up later that if you don't know these novella stories, they don't make sense. But because these novellas exist, you're like, oh, this person, incredible. So I feel like people either love that or hate that. I'm in the camp of loving it because if you, once you read Throne of Glass, I think these characters, you get really close to them. And so I'm somebody that like, I would just read novellas about all of them and I don't care. Just give me more content on them. I need to know more. So it just doesn't really bother me that you need this tiny book to make the big books make sense. But I can see why that would maybe bother certain people. We're going to go over the cast of characters real fast as well because I'm going to be naming people left and right. And I just want to give you a brief overview before we move forward. So here's our main girl, Selena Sardorthian. Secondary side note. The names are rough, okay? If I say it differently than you, that's okay. You can tell me down below. 
or you can just move on. You know who I'm talking about. I know who you're talking about. It's okay. It bothers me a lot that given the way it's spelled, her name is supposed to be pronounced Selena because there is a character later on named Elena. And I, I find that so stupid. Why didn't you just name her Selena? That's what I want to say when I read it. Why is it Selena? I, okay, so anyway, Selena has long, beautiful blonde hair, blue eyes ringed with gold, and she is 16 years old. She's a top tier assassin, basically the best in the city where she's from. When she leaves the Assassin's Guild where she lives, she covers her face, so most people don't know what she looks like. They know about her, and they know she's this, like, feared assassin, but they have no idea that she's a 16-year-old girl. Then we've got my bestie Sam Cortland. He's got brown hair, brown eyes. He's a sweet, sassy boy. He's a 17-year-old, equally top-tier assassin, basically always in constant competition with Selena. They work for Arabin Hamill, which is this guy. He's known as the king of the assassins. He's got long red hair, he's handsome, he's dangerous, he's that guy. You know this guy. Most of the time he's a sleazy, sarcastic asshole that I can't stand. He saves Selena's life in an event that we will slowly come to understand as the story goes on, but for right now that's why she stays with him because he saved her and even though he's an asshole he trained her and now she's like basically his heir. It's either gonna be her or Sam and they're kind of always fighting over it, but like she knows she's the favorite. Too hot the hood had to come off let's get into the first story it's called the assassin and the pirate lord we open with selena getting pulled out of her bed in the middle of the night she gets called down to a meeting with all the other assassins in the keep they live in this like very secluded kind of like big like warehousey mansion style building in Rifthold, which is the city where she lives. Arabin's at the head of the table. He explains that somebody betrayed them and one of their men has been kidnapped. And Selena's like, okay, so kill him. We can't let him get kidnapped and tortured and rat us out. And Sam is like, do you even have a heart? Like we can't just kill our people, okay? That don't be mean. Arabin stops Sam and Selena from bickering because they quite literally almost like attack each other over the table because they're children and they're fighting. He says that he already gave the order to kill the guy. I think this one's name is Greg. But what's really upsetting is that his second in command, Ben, has also been killed. Selena's devastated. Unlike the first guy getting kidnapped, this one really upsets Selena. And she's like, no, he was like my dad. He was like a cool older brother dad figure. I loved him. He taught me almost everything I know. We have to go get his body. And Sam's like, don't you think if we could have gotten his body, we would have done it by now, Selena? Be quiet. You don't understand what's going on here. It's too dangerous. And Selena's like, okay. Screw you, I'll go myself, and she goes and gets it. This just kind of proves to us that she is fearless and also very, very good at her job. So even when the men are like, that's too dangerous, we can't do it, Selena will do it, and she'll do it better than they could have. We cut to two months later when Selena and Sam have been sent over to Skulls Bay to meet with Captain Rolf, who is the Pirate Lord. He's late to the meeting, so Selena just makes herself at home in his office. She's like kicking her feet up on his chair, going through the papers on his desk. She takes some stuff and is just like generally being a menace. And Sam is just sitting in his chair waiting for Rolf, like vibrating at a frequency in which he could probably break glass because he's just so annoyed that she can never just follow the rules and be quiet. Rolf finally shows up and he's pissed that she's in his chair. He's like, get up and they get into like a little altercation where he's like get out of my fucking chair and she finally is like okay gosh you don't have to get mad jeez she's just a menace okay she's truly a menace to society i would once again like to remind everyone that she is 16 years old we learn that rolf supposedly sold his soul in order to get this cool tattoo on the back of his hands that like it's the ocean and it like moves and it shows him where treasure and enemies and storms are on the sea but we also learn that it doesn't actually work anymore because for some reason 
magic disappeared. So they have a letter from Arabin to give to Rolf. Basically, some assassins have been killed. They think it was the pirates, so they've been sent to collect debt money from Rolf. But Rolf is like, mm, yeah, I know that's why you guys are here, but my men didn't kill anybody, so I'm not giving you any money. It turns out that Arabin actually found out that Rolf was getting involved in the slave trade to make money, and he wanted to make more money, so the letter was all a lie, and he was actually just asking Rolf to help him get involved and like make a deal with him. So both Sam and Selena are like, are you kidding me right now? We will not be letting that happen. But they play along and they go on to the slave ships and they like meet the people and they're like severely mistreated. I mean, it's as dark and sad and depressing as you think it is. And Selena and Sam are both just like, we have to stop this. Like we can't let this happen. And Selena initially thinks that Sam is gonna be like, um, we can't go against Arabin. Like, I'm a goody two-shoes. I have to do what he says. Like, he's basically our dad. We have to listen to him. But instead, Sam is like, yeah, absolutely. I'll help you. What do you need? Tell me what to do and we'll do it. So they just hatch a plan to free all the slaves. This whole plan of hers is the start of Selena being like a Taylor Swift level mastermind and just always being like 8,000 steps ahead from everybody else. So if you're not interested in shit getting really bad and then Selena being like, I already handled it three chapters ago. You just didn't know. I don't know what to tell you, but it's gonna happen a lot. This is just instance number one. Unlike later on though, she does a pretty decent job of looping Sam in and keeping him updated in what she's thinking and doing. So they end up freeing the slaves, but in order to do that, they end up like wreaking havoc on the small port town. So the taverns get messed up, the ships get messed up, the like safety net that they have, that's like a big metal net that like raises and lowers and like keeps the little uh, bay closed off from the ocean. They destroy that and blow up one of the watchtowers. Uh, so Rolf's pissed when he realizes what's going on because not only did the slaves escape, but now his town is messed up. So. He's ready for blood. He attacks her, but she ends up cornering him into a deal because remember when I said she took some things from his office, one of those was his signet ring. So she already sent off letters and has like more papers drawn up. And she's like, if you don't do what I say, I'm gonna blackmail you. And because I have your ring and your seal, everybody's gonna believe that you did it. So she gets her way and he ends up being forced into signing the papers that basically say like, he will never in his life ever bargain or have any dealings with the slave trade ever again. And if she ever finds out, like she'll blackmail him and kill him. That doesn't come without a cost though, because now Rolf hates her and he knows what she looks like and he will never trust her again. In the chaos of this final fight, Sam goes down with the watchtower that he was supposed to explode and Selena gets there to the rubble and she can't find Sam. So she's freaking out, screaming, crying, throwing up, looking for him. And she's trying to like lift this giant piece of concrete because she's convinced that he's underneath it. And then he's like, mm, I don't think you can do that on your own. Like, I don't think that's gonna move. And she turns around and she's like, Sam, I thought you were dead. And he's like, no, I got out of the way. What are you talking about? And he's like laughing it off, but she is having a panic attack. So she just like throws herself into his arms and they hug for the first time. Remember when I said they hated each other? Maybe I lied. Maybe I'm a liar. Maybe you shouldn't trust anything that Selena ever says. Next story is called The Assassin and the Healer. We open a few weeks later with Selena in this shitty tavern, not in Rifthold. She's somewhere else. She's drinking bad, gross ale and antagonizing the men around her into a fight just so she can feel alive. We learn that as punishment for what she did in Skull's Bay, Arabin beat her nearly to death and then sent her away. She's on her way now to the Red Desert to train with the Silent Assassins. So she's on her way now to the Red Desert to train with the Silent Assassins. She has a month to get the uh, seal of approval from the master, the guy in charge of those assassins, and then she can come home to Arabin only once she has that. She's pretty miserable. So like not only was she beaten and she does make a point of saying that Arabin 
is so good at his job that he knew how to hit her so that her face wasn't like permanently disfigured, but she almost died. Like it, it was really, really, really bad. So she's recovering from that still, but also she's in this shitty little town and the travel from Rifthold to the Red Desert is unreal. She has to like go on horseback and then on a boat and then through the desert. So she's just dreading it and it's not going well. At this little tavern though, she meets a barmaid named Yurene. Yureen is from Finharo, which is like another little town. It's Adderlon. We should talk about that. There's a map. If I can find it, I'll put it here. But Adderlon itself is the country where magic is banned. So there's like a big stretch of land in this area where magic doesn't work. But there's rumors that it still works in other places, but Selena's never been there to find out. Some backstory on our girl Yureen. Her and her mom were healers, so they had magic, both of them. When it was banished eight years ago, they lost their powers. But anybody who was like known to have magic was still hunted down and killed, even once their powers stopped working. So Yurene's mom died protecting her. Yurene was originally on her way from Finharo to the Southern Continent, where they still have magic and there is a healing school that she really desperately wanted to go to. But the travel was more extensive than she thought it was gonna be and she ran out of money. And now now she's been working in this tiny little shithole tavern trying to get the money to go the rest of the way to the school and then also pay for the tuition. They don't really get along, the two girls. Selena's not really there for friends and Yureen just thinks that Selena's kind of intimidating so they sort of just avoid each other. But Yureen ends up getting attacked in the alley behind the bar and Selena shows up and saves her. Selena gets cut in this process and so Yurene is like, oh, let me help you, it's the least I could do. She heals her the non-magical way, so just with like medicines that she's made. It works and because of this kindness, Selena is like, you should really let me teach you because the men here suck and there's no way that won't happen to you again. What if they come back and I'm not here to help you? Even though it makes her a little nervous, Yurene agrees and they train together and like Yurene's a pretty quick learner and she picks up on the basics. Yurene is attacked again, but this time she's able to defend herself and she handles it on her own. And then Selena shows up and guts all the men. And she's like, good work, Miss Barmaid. You did a great job, I'm so proud of you. And Yurene is like, I'm gonna throw up. I can't believe I just did that, oh my God. That same night, Selena disappears without saying goodbye to Yurene, but Yurene finds in her room the ruby brooch that Selena's been wearing on her cloak and a bag of gold and a little note that says, for wherever you need to go and then some. The world needs more healers. So Yurene's hopefully gonna be able to go to the Southern Continent and learn to be a healer. I can't. on to novella three, The Assassin and the Desert. The desert is somehow even worse than Selena imagined it was gonna be. Reminder that she was sent here by Arabin to uh, learn discipline and obedience because he's a cowardly, cowardly man who didn't like being proved wrong. She also tells us here that she doesn't actually know what happened to Sam. She just knows that she was beaten, she woke up in bed, and then she got sent here, but she never saw Sam. She makes it to the Silent Assassin's Keep in the middle of the desert and gets to meet the Mute Master and he agrees to let her stay and train with them. So she ends up rooming with this girl named Ansel. She's got wine red hair and cool wolf themed armor. We also meet Ansel's boyfriend Mikal, who is too old for her and we are told that right off the bat. And then also the Mute Master's son Elias. So the silent assassins, as I said, are kind of floating out in the middle of the desert in this little fortress where they train and work. But there is a town close by called Xandria and there's a guy there named Lord Barrick who is attacking them constantly and trying to get into the fortress. Selena goes through some pretty intense training, including having to run back and forth through the desert six miles with like water jugs on her back as part of the daily training exercise. She still isn't training directly with the mute master though, and she's starting to get annoyed because that's the whole reason why she's there. So Lord Barrick, the big idiot over in the fancy town, attacks the fortress. His people are taken down 
easily, like little toy soldiers, because the silent assassins are terrifying. And then the next day, Ansel is sent over to the town to talk to Lord Beric, and she takes Selena along so she can kind of explore and have a day out. On their walk, Ansel talks about where she's from, which is Briarcliff in the Western Wastes. The Western Wastes are technically witch country, so Ansel gives us a little backstory about the Iron Teeth witches who overthrew the Crokin witches, and they have like a big war between the two clans. The Iron Teeth quite literally have iron teeth and nails that like come out like little claws. They're bloodthirsty and eat children. While Ansel is off talking to Lord Beric, Selena wanders around the market and we're reminded once again that this Barbie is an assassin, okay? So not only is she really good at killing and fighting, but she loves fashion. She loves expensive things. She has very expensive taste in clothes, shoes, jewelry. Her rooms back in Rifthold are like filled with like expensive stuff. She meets a spider silk merchant. Spider silk, for those of you wondering at home, is this like really durable, expensive material made from these giant spiders that are like bigger than horses. They live in the Rune Mountains. Rune Danon, crown prince of the Balbaran Fae. <laughs> He's a nice guy and they get to kind of talking and she's like, how did you even get this much spider silk? Like nobody ever has this much to sell like this. And he explains that he traded 20 years of his life for it and he can only ever get those years back if the spider that took them from him is killed. She says, maybe I could kill that spider for you one day and he gives her a little bit of spider silk, like just a small little square and is like, everything always comes with a price. Selena runs back into Ansel, who is now fleeing the city for some reason, and she's planning on stealing these basically like fey horses. I think they're called like Asterian horses, and they're just really strong, really fast, like better than any like mortal stallion would be. They easily outrace the guards and get back to the Assassin's Keep in the desert. The Mute Master is super angry with both of them when they get back, but Selena takes the blame for her bestie Ansel, even though they all know it was Ansel's fault. Fault, and the girls end up on stable duty. Selena, in this moment where she's like asking for forgiveness and like pretending like it was her fault, she definitely expects the mute master to hit her. And he clocks this and is just like, oh my God, you are so much more traumatized than I originally thought. He then decides that Selena's undergone enough changes that it's finally time for him to teach her himself. So we get this fun little montage of him taking her up to the roof every night and like working under the moon. He teaches her how to move and fight like a few different animals. It's a, it's a fun little scene. He's really sweet to her. You know what? I'm just going to touch on it real fast right now. Get it out of the way early in this series. I heard somebody say that they think it's kind of ridiculous that SJM has like a religious studies degree and yet there's no religion in her books. And it really hurt my feelings because there's a lot of like old religion in her books. She almost always has some kind of like pagan or Norse or Greek or Roman flavor. So there might not be like the big three religions in this book, but there's still a lot of like really cool religious stuff put in. And I like it a lot. It means a lot to me. <laughs> So I don't want to pretend like it's not in there and act like it's not good enough. Anyway, at this party for Midsummer, Ilias flirts with her, but she shuts him down. Then she gets into a pretty heated, ultimately very silly fight with Ansel. And Ansel ends up coming to her the next day and like apologizing and being like, I've never really had a girlfriend. Like, I don't know how to like not be mean to you. Like, I'm sorry. And Selena's like, me too. Like, I don't really have any girlfriends either. Like, I just want us to be okay. Like, I, I didn't mean to upset you, blah, blah, blah. So they make up. Ansel brought some tea as like a peace offering and it turns out she drugged Selena and so Selena passes out and wakes up in the desert with one of the fey horses and a note that says you need to leave but Selena being Selena is like lol fuck that and she goes right on back to the assassin's keep turns out that Beric attacked the fortress again and when Selena gets inside tons of the silent assassins are dead including Ansel's boyfriend Ilias is almost dead and then his dad is like not unconscious but he's like paralyzed and he can't move he's just like stuck on the ground and who is standing over him with a dagger 
freaking Ansel. Yeah, it turns out that she betrayed them. So she's the one that every time she's been meeting with Beric, she's been feeding him information on how to get into the fortress. And in exchange, he told her he would give her an army so that she could go back to her home in Briarcliff and free her people. So her family that she said she was like getting stronger for is actually dead and has been dead the whole time. Selena fights her and wins and is able to save the boys. So Ilias and his dad are alive. She tells Ansel that she's a 20 minute head start because they were friends and she needs to run. So Ansel takes off on the horse and starts riding off into the desert. We get a nice scene of Selena watching her run away and like drawing her bow to make the kill shot at the 20 minute mark. Ansel is not gonna make it. She's still too close and within range of Selena's shot but Selena waits until the 21 minute mark. So when she shoots the arrow, it misses and Ansel gets away. As a thank you for helping them, the Mute Master gives Selena enough money to buy her freedom from Arabin so that when she goes home, she doesn't have to work for him anymore and she can make her own choices for her life. Buckle up y'all, this one's called The Assassin in the Underworld. So Selena gets back home to Rifthold and Arabin just showers her with gifts. Okay, just classic like narcissistic abuser behavior. He's like, oh my God, I'm so glad you're home. I missed you so much. I can't believe I ever hurt you. Like I got you all these beautiful fun things to make it up to you. I promise I'll never ever hit you again, which is just a damn lie. He does it all the time. She gets a new mission to kill a guy she gets a new mission to kill a man who is supposedly working with the King of Adderlon to like make a new road in between their territories and improve trade. And Arabin is basically like, yeah, you know, the slave trade. I know how you feel about it. So I wanted to give this kill to you because I thought it would mean something to you. She runs into Sam finally. It's a little awkward. We find out that Sam threatened to kill Arabin when he was beating her because that was part of Sam's punishment was that Selena had to get beaten first so that Sam had to watch. And he fully was like, I will kill you in the middle of it. Part of his punishment for that statement has been that Sam has been forced to hang out and kind of babysit Lysandra. I have a lot of feelings about Lysandra, but I'm gonna tell you right now, in the beginning of this story, she is just the worst just the worst type of woman you've ever, every mean girl you've ever had to deal with in your life, wrap them into one person, add 10 times the amount of sass and snark and horribleness, and you've got like a fifth of what Lysandra is, okay? She's just freaking the worst. However, she's a child courtesan, okay? So I'm conflicted because I'm like, your personality makes me want to throw you in the garbage and your backstory makes me want to give you a hug. So she's like super good at her job, even though she's 17. So she's unable to take like full jobs yet. There's other stuff that she can do and she's Arabin's favorite. Disgusting. So Selena and Lysandra obviously hate each other more than I can possibly express to you in words. Selena is pretty annoyed with Sam having to watch him like just be okay with Arabin and like put up with Lysandra because normally he would get annoyed just like she does. But for some reason, he's just like brushing everything off and doing whatever they say. It turns out that Sam made a deal with Arabin in exchange for Sam forgiving him and basically acting like nothing happened. Arabin promised to never ever lay a finger on Selena again. Arabin gifts Selena and Sam these brand new fancy assassin suits that have like hidden weapons and they're like more movable and stuff like that. Also, just as like more repayment for beating them nearly to death. And Selena gives the little strip of spider silk that she has to the tailor and asks him to put it in one of the suits. Our little unfortunate group of four, Selena, Arabin, Sam, and Lysandra go out to the theater and we learn that Selena loves music. When they get home, she tries to play the song for herself on the piano, but she can't figure it out. She asks Sam to help her with this mission to kill this guy. His name is Donnie Ball. He's not really important, but that's his name, if you want to know. They spy on him and his bodyguard, but they don't learn anything. When they get home this time, Sam gifts her the freaking sheet music for that song she was trying to learn. 
If it's not clear already, these two have major like enemies to friends to lovers vibes and they are everything to me. The group goes out to yet another party to keep trying to gather information about Donnie Ball. Selena pretends to be Arabin's niece and a merchant's daughter in order to get closer to the target and like try to get him to talk about trading with her. She kind of implies maybe she could get him a deal with her fake dad and stuff like that. When like the working part of her night is over, Selena ends up dancing because again, she loves music, she loves having fun. So she's dancing, Sam is kind of monitoring her and like keeping her safe. And this group of masked men show up and she assumes they're royals because they're all kind of like fancily dressed and then they have the masks on like obscuring their faces. And they've come like maybe to a less wealthy part of the city to like have some fun. So this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful boy with blue eyes rocks up and tries to dance with her. He asks her what her name is and she gives this like ridiculous cringy line. This girl opens her mouth and says, my name is wind and rain and bone and dust. What? What does that even mean, Selena? You don't even know what that means. Then she says, I have no name. I am whoever the keepers of my fate tell me to be. Now that one, that one's gonna come back to haunt us. But then his moody little grumpy friend shows up and is like, we have to go. Blue eyed guy is like, we could have had fun maybe next time. And they leave and Selena's like, who was that? We will be seeing him again. I hope you're as excited as I am. <clears throat> but anyway, yes, yeah, Sam admits that he likes her, but he backs off very quickly when she says that she doesn't want to mess up the friendship they're just starting to form. So he agrees to like play it safe and like not go any farther. Selena then goes to a secret apartment in the city that she's been hiding from everybody. She bought it a while ago and just keeps it as like a hideout for herself. She ponders the pros and cons of either moving out or just keeping the money and staying with Arabin. The next day, Sam isn't able to go with her right away. So Selena just goes on her own to keep the mission going. And she ends up getting knocked out in the study of this guy's house and kidnapped. She wakes up trapped in the sewers underneath the house. She's able to get free, but the sewers are flooding. So she's gonna drown if she can't get out to the street. She makes it to a grate, but it's stuck and she can't get it off. Sam shows up because he came to check in on her and heard her calling for help. He also can't get the grate open. So the water is just rising and she's about to drown in poop. She whispers, take my body back to Terrison, Sam, and then gets pulled under the water, but She's fine. He got her out with the help of these like two ladies in a crowbar, okay? So she's fine. After this experience, they've grown closer. She talks to him about what she learned in the desert and decides that she does actually want to leave. So she pays off her debt to Arabin and he's really sad, but also like kind of proud of her for standing up and doing what she wants. And he's happy that she wants to keep working for him. Sam's really happy to hear that she's finally leaving and he also says that he might go too since he won't really have any reason to stay if she's gone. Yeah, it turns out he doesn't just like her. No, no, he loves her. He's been in love with her for so long, but he never made a move because he was positive that she would pick Arabin over him. She calls him an idiot because Arabin is like a creepy, gross, basically the age of her dad dude that she doesn't like. And she's like, of course I would pick you, Sam. And then she kisses him in the sewers. Interesting choice of location for a first kiss, but I'm gonna just ignore it. It's really sweet. So Selena breaks into the house again alone, even though Sam begged her not to do that. She doesn't want him to get hurt. So she goes by herself. She finds the documents that she needed. Basically the guy had all these documents that have like safe houses and um, exit tunnels and stuff like that listed out for people to free slaves. And she believes that he was gonna use this as blackmail with the king to get these people in trouble. She ends up killing this guy that was her target. Before she can kill the bodyguard though, he tells her she's a fool and that Donival loved his country and she knows nothing. Uh-oh. She finds the person who was coming to meet with Donival that she was also planning on killing, but before she can kill him, he burns the documents he was holding and kills himself. Very strange. Selena starts to slowly realize that Arabin was probably hiding something because this isn't adding up the way that it should be. She finds Sam, he was shot in the chest, but he's fine because she had that little piece of spider silk put into his suit, not hers. Selena confronts Arabin and it turns out, yeah, the whole thing was a lie, he's a liar. The ex-wife that hired the hit was actually the bad guy and the guy she killed was actually helping and getting people out of the city to safety. 
This makes her so angry that she admits she sold her fancy fay horse in order to also buy Sam's freedom. So now they're both leaving. Arabin's like, oh my God, that's great news. I need more money since I spent everything you gave me to buy Lysandra. Ew. Ew, 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 ew. Ew. No, absolutely not. Lysandra is awful to Selena and like teasing her about how happy she is and how far her money went. And she's gonna have so much fun with Arabin now that Selena's leaving. And Selena gets so angry that she throws a dagger at her and like cuts Lysandra on the cheek. Ultimately, we end this with Selena and Sam moving out happy and loving each other. tell you guys what I have to tell you but we have to talk about the assassin and the empire now I'm sorry we open with our girl Selena in a prison wagon she's curled up in the back not moving not speaking not doing good she's picturing a city burned to ash we go back to 11 days earlier Selena and Sam are now living in that secret apartment together, scraping by. They don't have a lot of money, but they're making it work. She's listening to concerts from like the rafters of the theater because she can't go inside anymore because now that Arabin hates her, she's kind of lost her like influence and wealth. Sam is fighting in a location called The Vaults, which is basically like a secret-ish fight club to make money. She hates that he's doing this because it's super dangerous. And he's like, okay, if you don't want me to do this anymore, we need to move. Like we need to just leave Rifthold entirely and run away together and start over somewhere else. She agrees, but she says they need more money in order to be able to do that. She wants to cut ties completely with the Assassin's Guild so that there's no way for Arabin to like need to come after them. They have such a cute romance, especially given the fact that they're 16 and 17 years old. Like they're very much like listening to each other, attentive of each other's needs. It's very sweet. So they go back to Arabin the next day and ask if they can buy their freedom from the Assassin's Guild and basically like pay off the last of their debts. Arabin somehow knows the exact amount of money that she has in her bank account. And he's like, that's how much I want for it. And she agrees. Sam leaves in a huff and then comes back later with information about a new target slash client situation that would make them enough money to leave the city forever. Except he doesn't actually know who the client was because they wore a mask. So they need to kill this very scary man named Jane and then his second in command named Ferran. They are respectively the biggest crime lord in the city and then his torturer. Selena is like, Sam, honey, you're insane for even considering that offer, okay? We can't kill them, that is so dangerous. This conversation leads to like kind of an intimate moment. So they have been sharing a bed this whole time, but Selena tells us that they have not had sex yet because she is 16 years old and she's a little nervous. But Sam has been super understanding and he's not pressuring her in the slightest. He says they have all the time in the world and he can wait. Anyway, she agrees to the mission and they start the recon phase. They both agree that Sam should kill Ferran because they don't want Selena anywhere alone with him because that guy is like vile and just despicable, despicable, evil man. And Sam's like, I'm not letting you anywhere near him. Just absolutely not. End of story. No. But Selena is going to kill the other guy. When Selena gets home that night, Arabin is just sitting in the living room on their couch. He tells her they're crazy for going after these targets. And she should also really tell Sam the truth about who she is and where she's from. Selena's having none of that and Arabin hits her with like, you know, I only do these things to you because I don't know how to express myself. And I'm really upset that you, a teenager, picked Sam, also a teenager, over me, a grown man who could be your father. This whole tell him who you really are and where you're from line does upset her though. So later on, she asks Sam what his biggest secret is. And our sweet boy is like, oh, I don't have one anymore. My big secret was that I'm in love with you. She tells him that her biggest secret is she's a coward and she's afraid all the time. Sam tells her that he gets scared too. But when he gets scared, he just repeats, my name is Sam Cortland and I will not be afraid to himself and it helps him calm down. This is so important and it will haunt us. It will haunt us. 
for years to come. Back to the mission, they follow Ferran around and realize that he is, in fact, as despicable as they thought he was. They bond over not being like that because even though they are trained killers and, like, this is what they do, there's a line for them and they don't, like, enjoy what they're doing. We cut to Sam getting ready to leave to go kill Ferran and then Selena is packing up because they're planning to move out of the city like the second the job is over. He tells her that Arabin actually also came to him and was like, you should ask Selena about her heritage. But Sam is just like, I don't really care. Like whatever he's talking about or not talking about, like you'll tell me when you're ready and I trust you. I'm not going anywhere. I love you. She's super touched by this and gives him a hug, but she's still not quite ready to say I love you back. So she just goes, ah, I hate packing. So the next chapter is Selena waiting and waiting for Sam to come back. Even though she promised not to interfere with his part of the mission, she goes looking for him and can't find him. He's still not home when she wakes up the next morning. So she goes looking for him again. This time when she comes home, Arabin is waiting for her in the living room and he stands up and says, I'm sorry. Yeah, so, mm hmm so he tells her that Ferran left Sam's body at the keep because he must have assumed that Sam still lived there. And Selena's like, I don't believe you, take me to him. And Arabin's like, you don't want to see him. And she's like, do it now. So he finally agrees and takes her back to the keep with him. Um, It's awful. It's so bad, okay? Um, it's really bad. So remember, Ferran was the torturer, and without going into, like, super graphic detail, like, <clears throat> Sam's body's pretty messed up, and so Selena, <clears throat> oh, it's getting me. Selena's very upset, and she ends up curling up on the bed with him and just holding his body and, like, crying and then falling asleep on him like that her internal monologue is basically her just freaking out about the fact that he was waiting down here for her and they just left him in this cold dark room alone and she can't also do that so that's why she just like lays down with him. She wakes up in her old room at the keep. There are some of the assassins outside and they're talking about like getting revenge for Sam but not bringing her with them. She breaks out of the room and is stopped by a man named Wesley who is Arabin's like most trusted bodyguard. He's always been really shitty to her so she kind of brushes him off and is just like leave me alone Wesley like I'm going you can't stop me. He tells her not to go and that he also wants revenge on what he did to Sam but doesn't she realize that it's all just a and then she knocks him out before he can finish the sentence. So she goes back to the target's house, breaks in, kills Jane, and nearly everyone else in the room. But before she can get to Ferran, he puts on a mask and then smoke fills the room and she passes out. It's called Gloriella and it's basically like a paralytic. Um, it is also what, remember when I said that the mute master was like paralyzed on the floor and he couldn't move? It was used on him in that moment. It's also what was used on Sam and it's why Sam couldn't fight back. Ferran wants to kill her, but he promised the person that he's working for that he wouldn't touch her and instead would turn her over to the king. She's horrified at the prospect of having to see the king of Adderlon, and she spends a couple days in the dungeons, like going deeper and deeper into herself and her grief, and Arabin never comes for her. Remember back in the beginning when she was like, oh, somebody got captured, just go ahead and kill them. And Sam was like, I can't believe you don't want to fight for our friends, blah, blah, blah. And Arabin was like, don't worry, I already sent the order. So it's safe to assume that Arabin's not coming because they don't get people out of the dungeons. She has her trial with the King of Adderlon and he is this awful, awful, nasty man who just rules over like a huge swath of the country with like an iron fist. She refuses to speak to him. And like, quite honestly, she's like having the worst day of her life just being anywhere near him. Like she's like trembling, shaking, almost throwing up. But she finds her voice and asks him in like a snarky way for a quick death. But instead, as like punishment for her being like insolent and annoying, he sends her to Indivere, which is like a salt mined prison camp. We then get a small scene of Ferran meeting with Arabin up on a roof, watching the prison wagon that she's in getting taken out of the city. Yeah, bro, it was Arabin all along. He did all of this to punish Selena and get rid of Sam. Why, do you ask? I'll tell you, because he doesn't like 
to share his belongings. Back in the prison wagon, Selena is slipping into a very dark place while she's being taken to the mines. They end up in Oakwald Forest and she sees a white stag watching her from the tree line. This is the Lord of the North. Selena actually told Ansel about his constellation and how he's like a symbol of the people of Terrasen, kind of like the North Star. It's like a guiding light to always get them home. Turns out though that these white stags were hunted and killed when magic disappeared. Along with entire territories like Terrasen, where it's kind of implied right now that magic was super prevalent and important. She tells the stag to run away and he listens to her and then she like curls up in a ball again. However, when she gets real close to the mines, she feels a breeze blow through the little tiny window that she has. It's a northern breeze smelling of pine and snow. This moment with this breeze gives her like a spark and kind of reignites like her spirit. She starts to decide that, you know what, screw it. She'll go into the mine just like they want, but instead of breaking, she'll stay strong. She'll keep Sam's memory close and pull it out when she needs to remember what it's like to be loved. And one day she'll get out and she'll find out who did this to her and Sam and she'll make them pay. And then she says, my name is Selena Sardorthian and I will not be afraid and holds her head up and struts out of the prison wagon into the camp. And that concludes our breakdown of Assassin's Blade. I hope you guys enjoyed when I tell you that Sam's death destroyed me absolutely unhinged behavior, I was very upset. I can't even imagine what would have happened to me if I had read this one like in the other version of like reading the books because there's like the, I did it the way where it's like chronological. So you read like the prequel because it's the prequel, but then there's like the romantic like feelings way and you can read it where like the prequel comes kind of in the middle and suddenly you realize who Sam is because she keeps talking about Sam the whole time. Like she never forgets about him. But if you don't know like what happened to him until later on, I feel like it would be just like a gut punch. It was a gut punch to me. And I knew the poor boy died before I started the book. And I was still upset. So, oh, there is a certain fan art that is just like the most soul crushing thing. If you guys know, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It, that's, ow. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the next update in this series. I hope you guys are having wonderful days and I will see you so, so soon. Have a good one. Bye.